Welcome to part three of this comparison of the 1975 Oldsmobile 98 Regency and the 1975 Oldsmobile Delta 88 Royale. We'll talk about the hardtop style as well as the 455 engines powering these vehicles. If you haven't seen parts one and two, check the link in the description below. Thanks for watching. All right, let's talk about some elements of the hardtop design. The last of the hardtops here, both for the coupe and the, the uh, hardtop, the four-door hardtop as well. So this one to me, as I was saying at the, the beginning of the video, I really enjoyed it because the Oldsmobile uh, has this actual window that goes down here still. The Chevrolet and the Cadillac did not. And it's, I think it's one of the last, it's a handsome treatment of this colonnade design, yeah, as you mentioned. Especially without the vinyl top, which makes the car look cleaner and less fussy. And it gives it, gives it a more pure appearance, which uh, makes the, enhances the appearance of the hardtop. You and I both love hardtops with anti-B pillar. <laughs> uh, we haven't gotten hit uh, in the sides yet, <laughs> we haven't gotten T-boned yet, uh, but um, I have to say that I do miss the hardtop for one other reason, because uh, as you well know, um, when you don't have a beat pillar, you don't get buffeting and unpleasant drafts in the interior. No, you can actually drive nicely with the windows down you and you drive. have great visibility. Great obviously. visibility, which uh, helps. Uh, we mentioned that in the previous video with the 59 models that if you have, you know, if you have blind spots in these cars, you are blind. And these are not quite so good as the late 50s cars in that regard, but they're pretty close, especially since the A-pillars are pencil thin. Yes. And they're so thin that under all normal conditions, they almost disappear from your field of view because of the parallax of the eyes. And this was the last uh, front windshield. The next generation didn't have this kind of plan view windshield. There's a lot of curvature to this windshield, yes. And that, I think, uh, a, that's part of the design theme, but I think B, it was also because the vent windows had disappeared um, by the early 1970s. Uh. It was also an aerodynamic device because the softer and the more gentle you roll this radius to the side, the less turbulence you generate with the airflow going around the side. And it's probably one of the major contributors to why it's so pleasant to drive with the windows down in these cars. Because even the previous generation was a relatively flat windshield too, the 65 to 70. Correct. This is the first one with kind of this... A lot of curl glass. in the glass, a lot of plan view uh, curvature, and a lot of uh, gentle soft radius going to the side, which help with wind noise as well. These cars actually have surprisingly low wind noise for, for the 19, for a 1970s car. They already did uh, wind tunnel testing for noise in those days to develop these, which is something that's routinely done today, but uh, wasn't done in the 1960s or 70s as a matter, uh, 70s as a matter of routine. So these were already designed with wind noise uh, in mind, so they have some features that are manifesting themselves in these shapes. Can and it, the glass is almost flush. Like if you look at the, if you look at the four door, uh, this uh, style of roof and glass integration was quoted interestingly by Ferdinand Piëch from Audi, who was the driving force behind the 1983 Audi or 84, it was in the US, Audi 5000 with the flush glass. This was the... These, these General Motors, these cars were quoted by Ferdinand Piëch as an inspiration for the upper because they looked so clean. There was an absolutely flush execution here and even the offset between the drip rails and the, uh, the C pillars on these cars is very minimal. So that gives them actually the uppers, uh, the, the, the roofs on these cars have a very modern and, and timeless appearance because they look quite precise and, and very high tech in a way because of the flush glass execution. And you can particularly see in this view when you see the glass barrels, a lot of curvature. We talked about the tumble earlier, how precise the glass fits together. It's amazing the window actually goes down in the door with how much tumble. Let's demonstrate is. that. <laughs> So here's what we have, uh, what we call a so-called monkey motion, where the panel of the rear glass actually articulates to an, at an angle in order to go through the kinetic motions that allow it to drop into the door. And for some reason, and I don't know why, on these cars, the gigantic door isn't gigantic enough to contain all of the glass. So that little stub of glass, a little slice of glass is uh, visible when the when the window is down, which is ridiculous. 
And if you follow the motion of the glass up and down, you'll see that it not only goes up, but also moves rearward to close the gap between the front and the rear door and make it almost seamless. And all that Very was cool. required to enable a hardtop. So a hardtop is actually a much more complex engineering challenge than just taking a hacksaw and cutting off the B-pillar. That's right. I mean, here's the kind of stub pillar, if you will. Yeah, you have to have this, um, all this uh, parts joining coming together. You do uh, have a bunch of ungainly gaps and also some potentially dangerous pinch points you have to engineer to prevent any accidents from that. And of course, naturally, you want to make sure that the glass uh, t seals tight and, and uh, minimizes wind noise and one of the things that always happens with older hardtops is they get kind of noisy because the rubber parts wear out and all the, the glass stops and all the various uh, touch points that are designed in to seal correctly they wear out so they get pretty loose and rattly after some time. On this car cool. it works still very well. And now, these cars, like you said, Mark, are so huge. Did that also contribute to some of that GM jiggle, if you will? I'm not privy to what they were thinking when they were engineering the body and frame combination of these. These have a massive perimeter frame, uh, again, designed primarily for crashworthiness and, and also low roof lines, so interior spaciousness, the placement of the members, the, the frame rails and cross members, all to maximize foot room and that sort of thing. But perimeter frames, by their nature, are pretty flexy, and they're supposed to be flexy. Uh, they're supposed to absorb vibration and road shock before it gets to the passengers by isolating that road shock and filtering it out with the body mounts. When these body mounts wear out or when there's misalignments in the, in the body mounting attachments, the bolts, uh, that can have a detrimental effect, and these cars can feel pretty shaky and rattly. This one is okay. Uh, I've driven worse, I've driven better. I think when they are when all the body bolts are torqued correctly and everything is aligned properly, they have an amazing uh, ride, very smooth ride. Uh, this car is a little loose over bumps. It's not quite as unperturbed by irregularities as you would wish a huge car with a 130 inch wheelbase <laughs> to be, but uh, it's pretty good by today's standards. It's a wonderfully comfortable ride. Another innovation that GM introduced was these super pliable uh, neoprene seals, which were an interesting thing of the 1970s. Oh, that's right, yeah. They're, they're still in squishy. very good shape. They're very squishy, and they're supposed to deflect and, and seat the glass properly. You can see that some of these marks in here are actually not just even molded in. They're actually from, from the glass uh, seating against it for so many years. Uh, but these are, when they go, they go quickly, but these are still in very good shape. So if you have a 1970s GM product with these neoprene seals and they're still in good shape, consider yourself lucky because uh, <laughs> they're hard to replace. They are hard. They're, it's labor intensive to yes, replace too. Yes, it's not yes. a fun job. So you want to want to watch out for that when, you, when you're looking for one of these cars. Well, very cool. And of course, an interesting and distinct styling feature, we have two different interpretations of the Oldsmobile split grille theme between the 88 and the 98. Yeah, as we were talking earlier, the uh, visual style of the 76 is trying to combine the sheer look with the more organic, softer shapes of the earlier 70s cars. On your 75, you still have very much the uh, early 70s style present. And you can see the location of the turn signal in the bumper, the bezels for the headlamps, the headlamps are still round, they're not square or rectangular yet. Um, there's still a lot of radius corners and softer treatments, while on the 76, it's very, very angular and very sharp. And the turn signal assembly moved into this whole side reflector and rectangular headlight theme and, and the grill itself is basically sharp corners and an egg crate grill very much like a Chevy Caprice or a Cadillac <laughs> and so in no emblem here in the middle of course this car has a stand-up hood ornament so yeah on the 75 you have an emblem in the middle and on the Regency in the 76 you had a stand-up hood ornament 
that vacated the little space of the split grill. It also looks like something's middle. missing, though, in that middle. It does, piece. doesn't it? It looks a little. Looks it, unfinished. It looks a bit unfinished. Looks a little, a little bit more austere than the 75. The 75 definitely has a richer, more elaborate front end execution, and of course, a much more interesting below bumper execution. You have the bumper guards. That's and right. And then you have the extensions of the grill texture. Oh under the front bumper, which on the 76 was omitted and just has two rather mundane holes. But of course, my car has an appropriate 1976 bicentennial license plate. <laughs> and I have, I have the appropriate have license blank. plate for today. You have a blank, <laughs> which tells me you are a finance guy because you're too cheap to buy a plate. Of course I would be. But I have the big rocket logo and you have just a blank space. I have a smaller rocket logo, but they, you know, a, a man's worth is not determined by the size of his rocket. <laughs> <laughs> that threw you, didn't it? It did throw me. Yeah, I have nothing to say. I like the the styling theme of mine better, of course. I actually do too. <laughs> but the rounded, said, it's interesting to you say though the the rounded corners. I don't know. It just seems like it's more in keeping with the tumble home correct, of the car, yes, right? Yes. This is the like seventy six is yeah. an unfortunate hybrid, but that is yeah. what makes it interesting to me is that it's not quite right. And it's the last one. I thought that was intriguing that it was the last of its kind with the Ford or hardtop or the hardtop in general, the last of yeah. the dinosaurs, the big dinosaurs. So that for me makes it very interesting. From a pure design point of view, I think the earlier models are definitely more attractive. That's the same with the roof lines. At first I did not like the additional window in the roof. So on the C pillars, for instance, on the four door, the early cars from 72 to seven, or 71 through 74 had a very thick C pillar. They didn't have that extra little quarter window. Uh, but when you actually live with these cars now and you drive them, you appreciate the extra visibility for such a huge vehicle. And uh, you also appreciate the extra kind of airiness and brightness in a cabin, especially with a black car, or black interior rather. That's true. Very neat. You certainly appreciate it too as the plastic fades on ours and it becomes a gold accent as opposed to a... You're still on that. <laughs> There's no talk in the world that can make that look pretty. <laughs> it is amazing how different, I mean similar but different, the styling themes are. Yeah, and now that we waited for the sun to go down a little bit and the body contours and the reflections to show up a little more strongly, you can really see how the lower skeg line yeah. and the reflections on the body side break up this, uh, the mass even more and make it look even longer than it actually is. And I have the wraparound tail light. You have the you do, separate which, side mean, marker light. That was one of the differentiators between the 98s. A lot of people make reference to the distinctive look of the cathedral tail lamps on the 98s. And it was sort of a reference to Cadillac because Cadillac had vertical accents and vertical lamp accents on their cars a lot in the, starting in the 1970s, late 60s, 1970s. And uh, they had them earlier in the forms, but it wasn't necessarily a distinct Cadillac trademark until uh, later. But um, it certainly was supposed to remind people of something upscale. It was supposed to get it closer to a Cadillac and more away from a Chevrolet. Mm. And you have the fuel filler door behind the license plate. I yes. have a little You have a little door with, a, with an applique above the license plate because your license plate's in the bumper. Which this would have been fun in an icy winter day, you know, where that yes. would have been impossible to open that little door. These cars were not designed with practicality in mind. <laughs> Certainly not in space efficiency. No. But when you sit in them uh, and you experience how much room is actually going to waste in spite of the huge size you'd expect to be extremely well accommodated, that's certainly not the case in the Regency because the design of the seat and the alignment with the pedals and the steering wheel and where your arms go on the armrest versus where they go on the center armrest, none of that is really balanced very well. So you have a huge interior, but you don't really get the comfort benefits of the huge interior, which is why the cars that uh, replaced them in 1977 are actually more comfortable to sit in than these. 
And I did bring this up to Blaine Jenkins, the interior designer of the Regency, many years ago when we were talking about these things and I asked them why they didn't pay any attention to these proper relationships. And, and he was kind of rolling his eyes and then looked at me and said, but you still bought one, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't have anything to uh, reply to that. <laughs> yes, you did, didn't you? And you still enjoy it. I still enjoy it. It's just because it started out on such a quick whim where I was riding with a friend who had one of these, but not the Regency, just the regular one. We took a ride and it was a really cheap thrill. So cheap even that uh, Todd Lassa did a ride up at Motor Trend Classic many years ago on my car as a little Cheap Wheels article uh, because they were basically nothing. You could pick them up for four, five, six grand well, now they're in really good shape. Now they are uh, less A little cheap. more than that. Yeah. yeah, I've seen them upwards of 20, 25 in good low mileage condition. Like yours, for instance, I don't think yours is up there yet, but it will, might, might go there pretty soon. And I know mine's definitely in five digit territory easily. It's probably uh, more towards 20 grand these days if you want one in that nice of a shape. Um, but everything is more expensive than it was, you know, just a few years ago, so. Very true. Underhood comparisons. Yes, so let's do an underhood comparison here of my car that does not have air conditioning or cruise control and Mark's that does have both. So you can notice how clean and open this engine bay is. It's pretty humorous. You can still see the bottom of the ground here. And one other thing too I've noticed is I have a two-line fuel pump. Mark has a three-line for vapor lock. So here, as you can see, the fuel pump. And then take a look at my wimpy little fan shroud with a non-declutching fan. I just have a standard four-blade fan. This car actually had a two-row radiator as well, which I had to record and upgrade to three-row. Here you can see the air conditioning on Mark's car, cruise control, and then he has a declutching fan and a much larger and fan shroud. a very sad remnant of the old uh, 455 sticker that had yeah. to be replaced at some <laughs> which point. Was, which was no longer <laughs> yeah. the rocket, by the yeah. way, this year. The fan shroud sticker is still pretty good. You can still read most of it, but the one on the air, air filter is... Uh, is pretty much all but gone. Yeah, you also have the uh, heater core shutoff valve for mm -hmm. the air conditioning there. Yep. And of course, you know, the evaporator and yeah. all of that. These are fun, you know, you could notice it's tough kind of to get the first two spark plugs. The easiest way to do that is to jack the car up, remove the tire, and that they present themselves very easily there. There you can see his three line fuel pump, also new. Your alternator might be a little bigger too, probably. Because yeah, of the it's air more capacity, higher capacity alternator for this car. I think the 98 came because the 98 came standard with the air conditioning, so it probably had the higher capacity alternator as standard equipment. Now this is interesting. I don't think mine, the EGR valve location has changed. Yours is kind of raised up. There was over some here. changes for 76 because yeah. these are the early catalytic converter cars, and I think the air pumps and the way the emissions plumbing is done changed a little bit every year yeah so mine has an EGR but it's in a different location mm -hmm. strange let's start it up yeah let's start both of them up one two three pretty good yeah two Oldsmobile 455s These are such uh, great motors. They are wonderful powertrains. This was kind of an offhand buy. It was just on a mood where, you know, on a whim where I wanted something that was a big 70s boat and I didn't really have that much emotional attachment to it initially. But it's grown on me so much that at the moment I can't even envision selling it ever. <laughs> it is amazing how much longer your car is too. An overall length. We're not quite parked at the same spot, but this is probably the only spot in the world where there are two Oldsmobile engines running at the same time, much less 455s. At the present time, perhaps. Yes. Very cool. Down with a barn door. <laughs> Down with the barn door, that's right. <laughs>
Well, thanks for watching this part three of the comparison between the 75 Oldsmobile Delta 88 Royale and the 76 Olds 98 Regency. If you haven't seen parts one and two, check out the link in the video description. If you like the video, please like and comment as that helps the YouTube algorithm serve it up to more viewers like you. And if you really enjoyed it, hit the super thanks button. Until the next video, be sure to check out some of the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some videos for you. And if you're not yet subscribed, click the circular icon of the 67 Buick Riviera at the top left. Then hit the bell to ensure you're notified of all my future videos. Thanks for watching and until next time, take care.